Our Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word and how it accurately diagnoses um, our condition, not to um, humiliate and shame us, but to point us to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask for your help as we dive back into this topic today. We pray that you would give us clarity, give us wisdom, lead us to your grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so part two of Doctrine of Sin. Last week, um, we, I gave just a brief kind of overview of some of the, the main things the Bible says about human sin. And we talked about how sin is, in a sense, not the way things are supposed to be. So we talked about God's design for his world to be uh, a flourishing creation filled with his glory and righteousness. The Bible often uses the word shalom to kind of capture that idea. Sin is the vandalism of shalom, the breaking of shalom. And so sin is not the way things are supposed to be. And then we also talked about uh, a little bit the nature of sin. And we looked at, you know, a couple, three key terms and then a handful of different metaphors the Bible uses to convey um, what sin is. And so this week, and, and I should add, we also talked about how Jesus is God's answer to the problem of human sin. And we, we looked at how he answers um, um, the different ways we, what sin is, he provides the solution. This week, we're going to kind of shift from thinking about sin in doctrinal terms and, and move more into how does, it, like kind of the so what, now what? You know, sin in everyday life. And I should say at the beginning, I changed the outline. So the, the handout you have, we printed it, and then I decided after it was printed, I'm doing it differently. So you don't have to tear it up, no, no. You don't have to tear it up. You can just cross out the headings, and then you can still use it to take notes. But um, if you, you're not, we're not going to follow the outline in the in the handout. So, what I I want to begin with three orienting truths. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but um, the first one is that Christ has already delivered us from the penalty of sin. So. Um, we are free from sin's condemning power. Our sins have been forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that means, as we saw in the year plus we spent in the book of Romans, that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have been justified, declared righteous before God through faith in Jesus Christ because of what Christ did. So, um, our standing as, as people who follow Christ, as people whose faith is in uh, Jesus Christ and his saving work, our standing with God is not in doubt. So Christ has already delivered us from the penalty of sin. Second, Christ has already delivered us from the power of sin. Now, that always kind of, I, it strikes me, it's a little jarring to hear that. I'm not, I didn't make up this sentence. Lots of theologians say this. Christ has already delivered us from the power of sin. This is Romans 6. You have died to sin. You, sin is no longer your master. Or another way um, it could be put is sin's dominion has been ended for all who are in Christ. We've died to sin. We've been united to Christ Sin's enslaving power has been broken. We're, we're no longer in those shackles um, that, that sin held us in. Christ has delivered us from that enslaving power. We now serve a new king. So he's already delivered us from the penalty of sin. He's already delivered us from the power, enslaving power of sin. He has not yet delivered us from the presence of sin. So, sin's dominion has ended, but its presence in our lives 
continues. And you know, its its influence remains. You, you could say the old habit of sin, the old way of thinking, um, desiring, acting, has been, you know, we've been deeply shaped by our life in sin. And even though we are now forgiven, even though we have been set free from the enslaving power of sin, the old habits die hard. And um, we're not going to get into the doctrine of sanctification today, but you know, the doctrine of sanctification says we are being transformed by God through the work of his spirit in Christ, but it's a progressive transformation. And so we still deal with um, what the Puritans used to call indwelling sin. We still struggle with sin. Um, our, the transformation we experience in Christ is not instantaneous. You know, we all wish that it was, but it's, it's not. And so what that means for everyday life is that temptation and sin are going to be a part of everyday life for us as Christians. They're gonna, it's going to be an ongoing struggle, um, this side of resurrection glory. So already delivered from the penalty of sin, already delivered from the power of sin, not yet delivered from the presence of sin. And so what that means is, um, or I should say, what, what should be our, our posture as Christians in light of that already not yet reality? And, and the, the term I want to give you is our, our posture should be one of watchfulness. Watchfulness. So you think of Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. And heart here in the biblical sense of not just uh, the emotions, but kind of the, the core of who you are. The, your heart is you, the real you, who you are. Keep your heart, guard your heart, it says. Because all of life flows out of that. Your words, your desires, your, your actions. Jesus also uh, said this to his disciples in Matthew 26. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So scripture urges us to this posture of watchfulness. Now, don't, you know, some of you are hearing this and you're thinking, okay, great. He's going to stand up there and kind of do his best Puritan impersonation and just start laying into us. That's not what this is about. Um, I, I, I appreciate the Puritans. I don't like to mimic the Puritans because I don't even think we mimic them well. But um, this isn't about some, uh, this is not going to be some oppressive guilt trip to make you feel ter about, terrible about yourself so that you stay as far away as possible from, from sin. This, this watchfulness, and we're going to talk about what it means, it's about honest Christian living in light of the fact that, that we're forgiven, we've been set free from the power of sin, but not yet delivered from its presence. It's about seeking grace. It's about living transparently and honestly before God and resting in Christ and putting our trust in his ongoing, uh, that he's continuing to renew and transform us. So what does watchfulness look like? Um, from the very early days of the church, Christians have developed different practices to promote or to cultivate watchfulness. And, you know, these are habits of life. These are um, rhythms, practices designed to help us be intentional about dealing with uh, the reality of indwelling sin. And, and so I want to just lay out three practices. They're, they're kind of overlap. They're interrelated. But, um, but we're going to look at them one by one. And all of these could be practiced in a group context, but we're going to focus on just what they look like for us as individuals. So the first one 
And this one will also make you go, oh, where's he going to go with this? The first one is self-examination. What should be our posture in light of the reality that we're not yet delivered from the presence of sin? Um, we should examine ourselves. Now, I'm pretty confident that that sounds about as enjoyable to you as like standing naked in front of a mirror and documenting every imperfection that you can find. It, self-examination doesn't sound enjoyable to me. Probably, I'm pretty sure it doesn't sound enjoyable to you. But when done well, and, and we'll talk about ways self-examination maybe goes off the rails. When it's done well, self-examination, it, it promotes humility and a deeper grasp of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if, if we're doing this, um, I think the way the Bible would have us do it, not the way that some sweaty Baptist preacher, you know, with a pointy finger tells you to do it, then it's going to, it's going to be painful because we're, we're seeing things about ourselves that um, aren't real pleasant. But it also leads us into a deeper uh, experience of and appreciation for the grace of Jesus Christ that is available to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So kind of a key verse, verses Psalm 139, 23 and 24 the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now notice, this isn't, the psalmist isn't beating himself up or fixating on his shortcomings if you're familiar with Psalm 139, this comes towards the end. The, the majority of the psalm is the psalmist rejoicing in the fact of God's um, intimate knowledge of him and God's comprehensive care for him. You know, he, he, the psalmist is like, you know everything about me. You created me before I was even born, while I was in my mother's womb. You, you knew me. And, and all throughout my life, you've, you've been there. I can't, I can't escape from you, not that he wants to, but like you're everywhere, you're with me. And in the context of that, what we would call grace-based relationship, that covenantal relationship, the psalmist, uh, it motivates him because of God's steadfast love and faithfulness, it motivates him to adopt a posture of transparency before God. He's an inviting God in, not that God doesn't know already, but he's inviting God to, to know him. To, and so he's making himself transparent before God and saying, look, see if there's, there's something amiss in me and, and please do something about it. Lead me in the way everlasting. So this is what we're getting at when I talk about self-examination. I'm, I'm going to give some more caveats in a bit. But I'm not talking about, you know, every day you should question whether you're really a Christian or not and then, you know, prove to yourself by everything you've done the day before that you really are a Christian. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, and I'll give some more caveats in a little bit. What am I talking about? Um, in, in one sense, we're talking about observing and evaluating what's going on inside us so that we can pursue grace-based change, so that we can intentionally pursue grace-based change. This isn't the only thing um, we do in the Christian life. Um, it's the first step in a process of bringing the gospel to bear on our struggle with sin. Now, why? Why would we spend time doing that painful work of paying attention to kind of the, the things that go on in our hearts and minds? Let me give you two reasons. Uh, one is the tyranny of the urgent. So we can get so busy with daily life that we don't notice patterns of sin that might be developing. You know, we're kind of just, we're doing our thing, and, 
and maybe what was, you know, just kind of a, a certain way of thinking, desiring, words, actions that were occasional become, are becoming more of a pattern now, and, and we're not, we're so busy, we're not paying attention to that. So, you know, impatience with a coworker or impatience with a family member has become your new norm. And you're so busy that you're not even really paying attention to that. So tyranny of the urgent, it's, it's healthy to, to pause sometimes and, and pay attention to what's going on inside of us. Second is our capacity for self-deception. So uh, one of the qualities of sin that the Bible talks about is that it's, it's deceptive. It lies. And we become very skilled at um, defending ourselves, excusing, minimizing our own faults and sins. And self-examination, um, it, it's like shining a light. It's like turning a light switch on in a dark room. And it, and it says, okay, here's, here's what's there. Here's what's there. So it, it can, you know, break through um, our, our tendency and our capacity to deceive ourselves. Now, what are we looking for? Um, actually, let me, let me give a caution first. Um, so there's your little, you know, caution sign. Floor's wet. Be careful. Self-examination can go off the rails, okay? And actually, the way that um, I've often heard self-examination talked about, um, I think is usually off, it's the, it's the, what I said earlier, you know, the sweaty Baptist preacher pointing the finger like, you, um, you enjoyed that TV show more than you're enjoying sitting through discipleship hour. How can you even consider yourself a Christian? Or you delight in dessert more than you delight in the Lord's Supper. What kind of poor excuse are you for a Christian? And it's just kind of this like over the top thing. Um, Self-examination is not the same thing as morbid introspection, okay? That, that's really important. Um, Self-examination is healthy. Doing some reflection, some honest evaluation is healthy. Morbid introspection is not healthy. Um, introspection leaves us preoccupied with ourselves. Our, our focus narrows so much that all we see is ourself and it leads to discouragement it leads to often sweeping generalizations that aren't even true about yourself um, it overlooks evidence of god's grace in your life how do we know when we're um, maybe sliding into morbid introspection as as opposed to maybe a healthy biblical practice of of self-reflection uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, he says, I suggest that we cross the line from self-examination to introspection when, in a sense, we do nothing but examine ourselves. And when such self-examination becomes the main and chief end in our life. Um, and so maybe this has been a struggle for you. Maybe you know people for whom this is a struggle. Um, where they're so consumed by their shortcomings and failures, whether, you know, their perceived shortcomings and failures and their actual shortcomings and failures, that that's kind of all they, they don't have any mental power to do anything else, think about anyone else, or that's unhealthy. And so we should practice self-examination as Christians. And what I mean by that is we should do it as people in Christ. Christ. And here's what I mean. We should only look inward as people who are self-consciously united to Jesus Christ. Okay? In other words, I only dare be transparent with God because I know that in Christ I am loved, I am forgiven, I am justified, I am welcomed, I am accepted, and that um, nothing that comes to light is a surprise to God or going to um, change the fact of his love 
for me in Christ. Um, I only dare turn on that light because I know that, that God loves me in Christ and wants to flood my life with his grace, okay? Um, otherwise, you know, if it's just, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to open myself up to God in and of myself apart from Christ and let's see how it goes, I mean, I'm just going to be crushed. Um, the, the, I was trying to think about the difference between um, doing some self-reflection in Christ and doing some morbid introspection um, apart from Christ. And it's kind of like the difference between, you know, getting in the ring with a professional boxer and the difference between that and going to a, um, a doctor who wants to heal you. You know, you get in the ring with a professional boxer, his whole aim is just to pummel you, just to hit you in the face as hard as he can, trying to knock you to the ground. I don't have any experience with boxing. I've just watched it. <laughs> um, I've listened to Mike Tyson talk about what he thinks when he goes into the ring. Um, boxer just wants to pummel you. The doctor wants to heal you. So the doctor is going to examine you. The doctor is maybe going to poke and prod, but not because he wants to make you miserable, but because she wants to bring healing and wholeness to your life. And so, um, you know, self-examination could, could go off the rails if we, if we forget who we are in Christ, if we aren't confident that um, God isn't surprised by um, what we discover. So, you know, you remember, we need to keep in mind you know, things that Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So, um, what should we, uh, what should we do? How do we do self-examination? Um, I'm going to borrow from Tim Keller here. He has a, some helpful things to say about this. Um, you know, he, he encourages us to, he encourages Christians to be specific or focused rather than general. In other words, you know, we could sit down and go, okay, search me, Lord. Is there any, is there any grievous way in me? And you're kind of like, well, I could think of 10,000 things right now. But um, he, he talks about focusing maybe on particular relationships, particular heart attitudes. You know, maybe you know certain things that are kind of a recurring struggle for you, envy or pride or uh, bitterness, anger, and so forth. And so that might be some of your focus. And he has a set of questions that I think are really helpful. I'm going to share them with you. They're, they're based on something that George Whitfield wrote, where George Whitfield had this prayer, God, give me a deep humility, a well-guided zeal, a burning love, and a single eye, and then let men or devils do their worst. Um, so... He takes these categories, deep humility. You know, some self-reflection would be, have I looked down on anyone? Have I been too stung by criticism? Um, have I felt snubbed and ignored? You know, these are questions that get at not just what have I done or maybe what am I doing, but what's going on in my heart? What? Have I been too stung by criticism and, and why do I, why am I so hurt? by this, you know, maybe even just helpful criticism somebody offered me? Am I, am I putting my, my hope and trust in others thinking well of me as opposed to resting in the fact that God accepts me in Christ? Um, Well-guided zeal. Have I avoided people or tasks that I know I should face? Have I failed to be circumspect? I, I don't expect you to write all these down. I'm just giving these as examples. Um, have I been rash or impulsive? So again, you know, you're, you're looking at a different facet of life, um, a burning love. Have I spoken or thought unkindly of anyone? Um, am I justifying myself by caricaturing someone else in my mind? Have I been impatient and irritable? Have I been self-absorbed, indifferent, inattentive to people? Um, the, the last category. Um, Am I doing what I do for God's glory and the good of others? So a single eye is kind of, you know, am I performing for others to try to get them to like me and think well of me and approve of me? Or am I living before the face of God for his glory and the good of others? 
Um, am I being driven by fears, by the need for approval, love of comfort and ease, need for control, hunger for acclaim and power, or the fear of other people? So, you know, these are hard questions to, to ask yourself and to probe um, your heart with, but, but they're necessary, okay? Now, how often do we need to do this like every half hour? I would say definitely not. <laughs> um, to some degree, you have to know yourself to answer that question, how often? Many Christians find that doing something like this on a daily basis is helpful. But as I mentioned earlier, you might be prone to morbid introspection and, tr and doing something like this every day is just gonna send you into a introspection tailspin. And so maybe it's more occasional. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a month. Um, maybe you're in a season of intense suffering or grief and um, what you need to spend more time dwelling on is the the grace of God in the gospel the comfort that God gives to the weak and the weary and the suffering and you can trust that through the ministry of God's word and the work of his Holy Spirit he's going to bring uh, things to light as needed in your life um, I the reason I say or part of the reason I say this is uh, Something uh, Robert Murray McShane, who was a Scottish pastor back in the 19th century, said um, to his own people, it was this, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace, and all for sinners, even the chief. So he's saying, look, it's healthy to do some self-reflection, some self-examination, but at the end of the day, you need to get, you need, at some point, you need to make that turn from the inward gaze to the upward gaze to Christ and his beauty and his glory. And he goes on to say this. Uh, this is really good. He says, live much in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in condemnation, judgment, and, and hatred. No. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. So I'm offering this as just a caveat to this idea of self-examination. I, I think, you know, like the psalmist, we should occasionally, regular, maybe even regularly, uh, have this posture of search me, God. The, the God who has loved me from all eternity and redeemed me in Jesus Christ, please, please show me where I'm wandering and lead me back to yourself. Um, so I'm offering this as the caveat that we don't get so obsessed with where we fall short that we lose sight of um, the, the loveliness of Jesus Christ and God's grace in Jesus Christ. Okay, so I spent way, way more time on that than I wanted to. But um, remember last week I talked about I was trying to learn how to ask better questions. I was listening to things about facilitating discussions. So I'm not going to just say any questions. I've got some more particular questions for you before we move on. Um, we'll see if anybody's willing to answer this. How do you feel about self-reflection? Um, do you find it easy to assess uh, faults, short, shortcomings, and sins honestly, or does it make you uncomfortable, and, and why? Anybody willing to, to share? All right, Elise is willing. Uh, Jared, she's, she's over here. For me, self-reflection goes way too fast into self-condemnation. Yeah. That's, I understand that's my personality. It's how I'm 
bent. Um, so for me, thinking a lot, thinking more about what Christ has done than the zillions of ways that I've, I've already failed today, today, mm -hmm. um, is really helpful. That's just for me personally. Yeah. I know not everybody's like that. Yeah. I think it's, it's true for a, a lot of people, not everybody, but a, a good number of Christians like you will quickly uh, make that transition into self-condemnation. And so self-reflection can go off the rails. Anybody else? Yeah, Daylin in the back. And then, did you have your hand too? I think it depends on the day. Sometimes uh, I can self-reflect and come quick to recognizing my sin and basking in the forgiveness that is there for it. And then there's um, other times it comes sooner, more thankful, more aware of the, the ways that we can bask in his beams and live in that forgiveness. Uh, so yeah, it just depends on the day. Sometimes it takes longer and sometimes it comes faster. But that, I think that quote up there is really good, remembering that we can settle in his love and rest in his love mm -hmm. is so, is such a gift. Yeah, for me, um, I, I basically don't try to do this in the mornings. So in the mornings, I am more prone to to go quickly towards the morbid introspection. And so I generally don't try to do anything like this in the mornings. In the mornings, it's more like, God, you're my rock, you're my refuge. <laughs> Thank you for your grace. Later in the day, I might be in a better play, mental space to do something like this. So again, knowing yourself um, is important. All right, we gotta keep moving. Uh, the first practice is self-examination, but second, and this leads into, you know, what do you do with the things that you find as you're reflecting? Um, confession. Confess your sins. Um, you don't really want to just stop at self-examination. That just kind of leads you with, you know, I see all the junk and I'm left with that. What do I do with it? Um, uh, confession is what we do with the ugly things we find. Um, one of the key verses here, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, what is confession? Um, you know, a simple way of thinking about it is it's an acknowledgement and a, an admission of our sins to God. It's agreeing with God's assessment of our thoughts, words, deeds. Um, it, it really goes beyond just admission. You think of Proverbs 28, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. So uh, confession and repentance, that's essentially what Proverbs 28, 13 is describing, forsaking sin, repentance. They go hand in hand. Um, confession without repentance is really just kind of hoping to get off the hook. Um, but confession and repentance go together. Um, how do we know that God, okay, so we've, we've done some reflection in the light of God, we've brought God's word to bear on our lives. We've discovered some ugly things and we've admitted those ugly things to God. How do we know he's going to forgive us? What are we, what are we trying to do? Is, is confession our, our attempt to appease God by um, acknowledging how bad we are? That might be, you know, how we tend to think of confession, that if I grovel enough, if I make myself miserable enough, then maybe God will cut me some slack. Um, I came across a, a, a helpful correction to that idea this week. Uh, this author said, we confess sin in the context of the covenant Lord's love shown to us through Jesus Christ. 
we offer our confession as part of a covenantal relationship. So confession is rooted in what God has done for us in Christ. That's what 1 John 1, 9 says. That Jesus paid our debt at the cross. And 1 John 1, 9 is telling us because Christ paid the debt, God would be unjust to not forgive us. I mean, that's kind of, if it wasn't for Christ, we would never dare say something like that. But because Christ did what he did for us, God would be unjust and unfaithful to his promises if he didn't forgive. And so we come to God in confession because of what he's promised, because of what he's done. Um, and in the confidence and the assurance that because of Christ, this is true, and God's not going to turn me away. God's not going to say, not this time, buddy. You, you've met your quota for the week. Um, no, Christ paid it all, and so God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And later, First John, in chapter 2, he says, uh, look, I write this to you so that you wouldn't sin, but if you do sin, we have a, an advocate with the Father. You know, it's this realism. Um, as Christians, we're, we're striving against our sinful inclinations, seeking to live lives that are pleasing to God. But we know that that's not always going to happen. And so uh, John says, look, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So um, confession isn't about trying to coerce a few drops of mercy out of, out of a stingy God. It's about realigning ourselves with the God of all grace and, and seeking his grace. Um, God took the initiative in establishing a covenantal relationship with us in Christ based on grace. And in response, we, we come to God humbly with um, honest confession about our sins. And, Sinclair Ferguson talks about this as the grammar of the gospel. You know, you might be familiar with indicative imperative. God's action and grace come first. He sent Christ to live and die and rise for us. And so we now respond um, in, in humble confession to what God has done. So question that comes up often when we think about confession, why confess if we're already forgiven? in Christ. If Jesus already paid the debt of our sins, why do we have to do this? Um, or um, God knows everything. It's not like I'm informing him of something. Why confess? Let me, let me try to um, explain this by way of an illustration. You think of a mother and a, a young daughter, maybe a 10-year-old daughter. And the, the mother asks her daughter to clean her room, to straighten up her room before dinner. And, and the daughter says, okay, and then goes back to her room. And instead of tidying up and, and doing what her mom asked, she spends the whole time on her um, iPad making videos of herself doing silly dance moves. And, and then it comes time for dinner, and um, the mom takes a look at the room, and sees that her daughter has uh, disregarded her instructions and um, didn't do what she was supposed to do. What happens when the mom finds out that her daughter disobeyed? Does the mom say, okay, pack your bags, I'm shipping you off to an orphanage? Now, depending on the, the week, and how things have been going, maybe the mom thinks something like that <laughs> momentarily. But no, the mom does not disown her daughter because the daughter uh, failed. Uh, the mom still loves her daughter. The daughter's disobedience and failure doesn't change that, uh, the fact that she's deeply loved. But the daughter's disobedience does displease her mother, right? It, I mean... For it, there's, we talked about sin last week as a, as a rupture in the relationship. This, this daughter's disobedience causes some relational friction and, and uh, disruption. And the daughter's experience of, of being loved is going to be hindered, right? 
until she comes clean and hears her mother's gracious words of forgiveness. You know, until she, she comes to terms with the fact that she maybe uh, defies, maybe too strong of a word, but didn't do what her mom asked her to do. She's going to wonder, what, what's, what's the relationship right now between me and her? Confession brings that out into the open and creates space for forgiveness to be given and experienced. And so we confess because our relationship with God is a dynamic thing. It's not just this static thing. It's, um, and sin disrupts fellowship. And so, um, so we confess. Uh, let me let's see. Let me see if I can skip ahead a little bit. Um, what should we confess? Um, you know, again, sort of like examination being specific is always better than, than being general. Um, so, you know, not, God, I, I guess I sinned some way, but Lord, I spoke harshly to whoever. Um, Lord, I, I lied. Not, I kind of, sort of didn't, you know, um, give the whole story. Um, I lied. Uh, another thing to be aware of, sins of commission versus sins of omission. You know, the Book of Common Prayer has this, you know, beautiful prayer of confession, and it, uh, towards the beginning, it says, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have not done those things which we ought not to have done. So, the things we've left undone that we ought to have done, sins of omission. We should have loved our neighbor. We didn't. Sins of commission. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. Um, you know, sins of commission are the things we think about all the time. The, you know, the kind of the big things, that, the wrong things we've done. Sins of omission, failing to do what's good and right. You think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the priest and the Levite see the, the man who had been beaten and robbed laying on the ground. They didn't beat him. They didn't rob him. They didn't kick him while he's down or, you know, see if anything, any money got left behind and, and so they could take it and run. They just kind of steered clear of him. They failed to be good neighbors. That's sins of omission. Um, Darcy and Craig and I were talking about just experiences of parenting this week, and um, Darcy said she'll address something with her kids. I'm not going to give any specifics here. Uh, she'll address something with her kids, and one of them will reply, um, but I didn't do anything to her. And Darcy's like, yeah, that's the problem. You should have, could have um, done good to your sister. Instead, you, you failed to do it. So sins of commission, omission. Um, again, let me, let me skip over these. Um, a caution. Some of us are prone to ruminate on, you know, obsessively kind of dwell on our shortcomings and failures. And it, it's good to be specific. It's good to take honest stock. But uh, we need to realize we're never going to know our hearts fully and comprehensively. So, some of us can get stuck in trying to do the, like, complete, it's not a brain dump, maybe heart dump of, like, trying to find every particular little sin. And the reality is that the human heart is deep and mysterious and deceitful, and we're never going to know it all. <laughs> Confess known sin. Trust that God will make clear um, what's not clear to you at the moment and receive his forgiveness and move on. Uh, and I don't mean that in a, like a flippant way, like sin's no big deal. I mean, take God at his word <laughs> that he really does. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, okay. Uh, first practice, self-examination. Second practice, confession. The third practice kind of brings these together. Remember I said if, if, we, if we do these practices well, they can lead us to a, a deeper um, grasp and experience of God's grace. And the third practice is, um, I'm calling it internalizing the gospel. Internalizing the gospel. So, 
It's one thing to assent to the truth of the gospel, to say, yes, Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. Yes, God, God forgives sin through Christ. Um, internalizing the gospel is another. Um, internalizing the gospel is like eating food. So um, it's, the, it's about the gospel entering our soul the way that um, food travels from the mouth to the stomach and then the nutrients in, those, in the food is dispersed to the rest of the body and absorbed um, by the, into the bloodstream. Um, we we want to get the gospel into us su such that it's a, a living reality. Not just, you know, being able to recite Bible verses or or the answers to catechism questions, but really living in light of the fact that in Jesus Christ, there's grace upon grace upon grace for our sin and failures and shortcomings. So um, we examine our hearts and confess our sins not to make ourselves miserable, but so that we might receive and experience God's uh, cleansing, redeeming, renewing grace. And so... Um, after some self-reflection and confession, uh, take time to, to chew on God's promises, to chew on his promises to forgive your sins. You're, you're wanting to bring various aspects of the gospel to bear on um, maybe the things you've reflected on and confessed. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, Tim Keller says this, Perhaps the most life-giving and crucial part of these practices is found in using the joy and benefits of the gospel to both convict and assure you at the same time. And I'll show you some examples of how he, he does this. Um, so let's say we've, we've spent some time in self-examination, confession, dealing with pride. Uh, he, Keller has this prayer. He says, Oh Lord, I fall into pride. So, confession. But on the cross, you made yourself of no reputation and gave up all your power and glory for me. The more I thank you and rejoice that you did that, the less I need to worry about my own honor and reputation, about whether people are approving of me or not. So, you see how it goes beyond just like I did a bad thing, and it's but yes, I, I did this thing, but, but because of your grace, and the more I dwell on your grace and, and your humility, Lord, Lord Jesus, in making yourself of no account for me and, and being despised and rejected for me, the more I dwell on that and, and absorb that and take that into myself, I realize I don't need to go around with some arrogant posture asserting my own you know, superiority and making sure everyone is aware of that. It's, it's internalizing the gospel or, oh Lord, I fall into coldness and irritability. But in the garden, just before you died, you were so gentle and affirming of us, even when we went to sleep on you. On the cross, you were giving yourself for people who abandoned you or mocked you. The more I thank you and rejoice that you did that for me, the more it melts away my hardness and makes me able to be patient and attentive to people around me. So again, you see the, the sin, okay, coldness, irritability, but then bringing the gospel into the picture. Not only I'm forgiven, but also the, the grace of Jesus Christ is, is going to transform me the more that I take that in and understand who he is and what he did for me. Um, another example. This one, not so much dealing with sin, but just struggles and weakness. Oh, oh Lord, I fall into anxiety and fearfulness, but you face the most astonishing dangers for me. You were torn to pieces so bravely for me so I could be utterly loved and eternally safe in you. If you were courageous for me facing those overwhelming cosmic evils, I know you are with me now. Therefore, I can be steady as I face my problems. So again, bringing the gospel into, in this case, you know, a, a fear, a struggle, a weakness. So internalizing the gospel, um, 
I actually feel like this is the hardest part. I, I know the self-examination and confession are painful, but I find this is the, it's hard to internalize, right? You and I know these things. It's hard to, to live in their reality when you feel like, oh, I did that thing again. Being able to rest in Christ's abundant grace and power to transform, it's hard. And um, so I actually think this stage, internalize, is, is the hardest part. But there's kind of a, um, anybody familiar with the term virtuous cycle? It's used in business and software and uh, other things. It's this idea that um, one, it's a positive feedback loop. So one positive outcome contributes and motivates more positive outcomes. Um, and the more the positive outcomes accumulate, it keeps you motivated to pursuing the goal. And it's kind of like how these practices work. You have some grasp of the gospel and the greatness of God's grace, and that frees you to do the painful work of self-examination and confession. And the more you um, do some of that reflection and confession, it, it leads you to the gospel and to deeper experiences of grace. And those deeper experiences of grace make you even more transparent and open to uh, asking God to search you and know you. And it just kind of keeps, it's this f feedback loop. The, um, ideally, that's how this would work. Um, I, I offered my cautions earlier about our, many of us are, are prone to get stuck maybe in this, this first step or, or second step. But um, the more the more clearly we see our sin and bring it before the Lord and receive his cleansing, forgiving grace, the less frightening it becomes to, to see those ugly things and, and bring them before the Lord. So uh, let me ask, let me throw out a few questions as we, we start to wrap up, um, if anybody's willing to answer these. Um, what keeps you from, we kind of touched on this already, but what keeps you from engaging in these practices? Um, what do you find difficult about these practices? What do you find maybe encouraging about those practice, these practices? So let's kind of just think about those three, um, if anybody's willing to share. Penny. Jared's going to bring the microphone. Well, the first one, um, say the first one again. Self-examination. But the first question. Oh, uh, what keeps you from engaging in these practices? Okay, what keeps, what keeps us from engaging, I think, at least this is true in my, in my life, is that um, that we don't see immediate and tangible results. When we work and we do our work and we do our tasks, we see the results of that. So it takes faith. And I think, you know, my faith is weak at times. I don't see, you know, somehow or another, we don't make the connection between if I take the time to do this, because it takes time, mm -hmm. that, <clears throat> the outcome is going to be worth yeah. the effort. And it, even in the doing of it, I think God gives us faith. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That you don't, you know, you're like, I confess my sins, but it's not like I'm, you know, forever done with that now. We don't see the immediate fruit that can be hard. I, I think what's hard is that I would rather focus on the things that I'm doing well or at least I think I'm doing well. And, you know, I think about the letters that Jesus sent to the churches in Revelation. He, he would say, you know, I, these are good things, but I have this thing against you. And whatever it's going to be, you've lost your first love. He didn't say like, uh, you know, fail, X, you're out of here. Yeah. He says, uh, you need correction in this. And so it is uh, for our good, but... 
sometimes it's hard to, um, when you just want to hear, um, you're doing a good job to hear but, um, and take that in and, um, and strive to, to do better. And, and the other side is, um, you know, pride creeps in um, that I'm, I'm, you know, maybe not as good as I could be, but I'm a whole lot better than what I was or, or some, what somebody else is doing right now. Hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's just so uh, insidious to, uh, and that's countered well by looking at what Jesus has done. Yeah. I don't know who said it. Maybe it was Martin Luther. I'm not sure, but I, I need to repent of my repentance. <laughs> um, I, I will say, and I didn't really talk about this because it wasn't kind of the focus, but not all self-examination needs to be sin hunting. Some of it can be, let me, let me reflect on the day and see evidences of God's grace. Let me see evidences of ways that I, I am seeing some change, and let me thank God for that and ask him for more grace. So not all of the self-reflection needs to be, you know, let me jump in the boxing ring. Um, some of it can be, I think it should be, um, also a time of uh, thanksgiving and praise and um, I think that's healthy too. Some, did you have your hand up? Kim's got her. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out in this cycle for me, where is behavior modification? Because I have a responsibility to change where I'm seeing I'm falling short and ask the Lord, please work with me and let me see the way to reach where I want to be. It, as long as that's in this cycle, it works for me where I have to, but it's my responsibility, I believe, as a Christian and a believer to ask for help to do better. Yeah, so we'll get to the doctrine of sanctification eventually. Um, so that, that will be, you know, how do we grow as Christians? Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Andrew, and then we'll get you Umberto after Andrew. Uh, when I was a bit younger, a pastor of mine encouraged kind of all the young men and women to have like a word of the year. So it was like you think through the whole year and you're like, okay, what was like a main theme that I needed to work on? And some Sometimes, you know, it was different things. Sometimes it was pride or arrogance or, or attentiveness to other people. So on one year, it was attentive for that year. And so you just kind of like, you know, every time you remember, you're like, oh, was I attentive today or this week? Where, where was that? Where did I nail it? Where didn't I? And I, I found that to be really helpful. Um, for me, it, a yearly one I found to be a little short because I usually like do really well the first three months. And I'm now at like six months and I'm like, my word of the year was, <laughs> trying to remember, um, but that, that's that been really helpful for me. Uh, I might split it into monthly or something so give some in the focus. future, but yeah, but also to have a yearly one, you come to the end of the year and you're like, okay, that was it. This is how I did good. Here's how I could do better. And sometimes I've kept the same word because it's like, oh, this is a fundamental problem I have. Um, or sometimes I'm like, that word of the year, like, didn't have much problem with like I don't think that's my issue so I change it so I don't know I found that to be a simple and really a, a effective thing yeah. um, and it's it's good like other people I know do it and sometimes we like ask each other like hey what's your word of the year how's that going and they're like easy how about you oh terribly rough <laughs> I think my so. word would be everything uh. Uh, Umberto I think for me too, it's probably easier to like, I just think on my way to work, I'm like, do I want to think about stuff and turn off and all the noise or do I want to just listen to the next podcast or whatever? And it's easier to consume more content, yeah. even if it's good content. Um, but it's, it, it so it's kind of scary to be in your own thoughts and yeah. think about how God has been faithful to us how I've been unfaithful to him. Um, 
although it, it, it can be, when you actually start doing that, it can be very sweet. Uh, but there is some kind of initial scariness of, of, of eh, I'd rather just listen to the next thing. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that'll be good, even though it's like, sometimes it's nice to just, you know, actually face your, your own thoughts and uh, reflect on uh, God's grace and, and in your life. So. Yeah. Maybe one more, if anybody. Yeah, Daylin. Oh. What was the last question that you asked? Uh, is there something you find encouraging about these practices? Oh, yeah, that was. So if you go through the whole cycle, there's joy. Like the byproduct of all of this is like boundless joy. And um, Psalms 4 7 says, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. And I think that's when we can go full circle in that. Yeah, the world doesn't offer joy like the Lord can offer, even when we recognize how awful we are. So that joy is the encouragement. Yeah, ideally it's, it's leading us it, to Christ, experiencing his grace, which produces joy. I think you know, it, it takes practice like anything else in life because we'll end up going off the rails on before we get to the joy part. Darcy, did you have something? Okay. I was just going to pick up on Umberto's comment. I, that's totally something I struggle with. And one thing I found super helpful is um, ladies' Bible study. Mm. It's There's something unique about being around God's Word with other people other people and hearing how he's speaking to them through the passage, I find it some of the most convicting and encouraging times. So for a person who struggles with introspection, being around God's people and hearing uh, from them has been I, a huge, I could get better at what Umberto's talking about, but it's been a huge um, helpful thing to me. Yeah, that's good. I, I left it out of this lesson, but um, this whole idea of, you know, James says, confess your sins to one another. And we're like, what in the world are you talking about? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together, has a whole chapter on confessing your sins to each other and talks about how, like, we need to get those things out and we need to hear someone outside of ourselves say, you're forgiven in Christ. And if you have that book, go read that chapter. I, I haven't quite brought myself to the place where, like, that's a normal, um, you know, kind of habitual thing. But he makes a strong case for why we need um, a regular practice of confessing our sins to one another. Um, it, I think it's very challenging. But it's that, that dynamic of needing, if we're just left alone to ourselves, we can get stuck. So uh, let, let, me, let me end there. We're going to, um, I'll pray, and, and then we'll be finished for today. Our Father in heaven, um, it's hard for us, Father, to, uh, to look at the, the junk in our lives. But we pray that your love and the freeness of your grace in Jesus Christ would, would motivate us to be transparent and honest before you. We pray that... Um, as we become more comfortable bringing our, our ugliness to you and experiencing your cleansing grace, that, that it would motivate us all the more to be honest with you and each other. We pray that you would work good in our lives uh, through honesty about our sin and that the end result would be our lives more firmly rooted and grounded in the the grace of our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.